بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه الطاهرين ما دام ما في السماوات والأرضين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما اللهم إنا نسألك علما ينفعنا ورفعنا اللهم إنا نسألك علما نافعا ورزقا واسعا وعملا متقبلا وشفاء من كل داء وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته الحمد لله we thank and praise Allah سبحانه وتعالى for making us Muslims first and foremost and from amongst the followers of our beloved master and liege Lord Muhammad صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم the book started off by قلب البدء changing around the changing around the word بدأ بدأ means to begin and if you flip it around it becomes أدبا which means etiquette so the first step in terms of spiritual development is referred to as etiquette so we've come to that point in terms of the poem that the author proceeds to the second step so he says now وبعد وصل البدء فالإتقان لعيلة للأفئدة الثنيان. so what comes second? so he says إرفان أمراض القلوب وسبب كل وما يزيل عينا وجب. he says the second step is to come to recognize the ailments of the heart. and the word that he uses for heart here is أفئدة, which is the plural of the word for add. certain scholars draw a distinction between uh, the spiritual organ when you refer to it as qalb and when you refer to it as fu'ad fu'ad means when it's in a state of agitation so this heart when it's in, a f in its state of agitation it means that it is beset with certain ailments and we need to remove those particular ailments but what are the ailments of the heart so that's the next step in terms of spiritual refinement uh, which is an important which is an important step so he says, Irfanu amrad al The word Irfan means to recognize, but here really to define what a spiritual ailment is in order to rid ourselves thereof. Uh, so that is the that is the first step. Irfanu amrad al was sabab. And then also if we have a spiritual ailment, we know the the, the, the wording of the Quran says, Wadaru that abandoned the apparent sins and also the non-apparent sins in other words sins of the heart and sins of the limbs but what are they so first we need to recognize what they are so we have a list but then of equal importance is that what leads to it so for example let's say I'm beset with a spiritual ailment it, it's called niggardliness it's called miseriness so what causes miserliness? It's very much like, it's very much like um, an apparent ailment. Uh, for example, cancer. It's an ailment. I want to familiarize myself with cancer. And then also I want to know what leads to cancer. So likewise, um, spiritual ailments are no different. We need to know what they are and we need to know the, the causes. For example, I find myself that I am beset with jealousy. So that's an ailment. I know I need to rid myself of this ailment. It's one of the cardinal sins, so to say. But what causes me to become jealous? And this is one of the unique um, uh, features of this particular book. It's not only going to highlight the ailment. It's going to highlight uh, the causes of that particular ailment. So he says we need to know, we need to know that. وَمَا يُزِيلُ عَيْنًا وَجَبْ So uh, one is to know the ailment, one is to know the cause of the ailment, and number three, very importantly, so you know the ailment, you know the cause, but how do you remove it? So this book, uh, very categorically, it's going to list the ailments, the cause of the ailments, 
and it's also going to provide a remedy. It's going to provide a solution. How do I remove that particular ailment? Like uh, one would be that uh, I'm, uh, I'm miserly, I'm niggardly. So what would appear to any of us would be that initially you need to find generosity. You know, just give uh, up until it becomes second nature. So that would be like a simplistic remedy for niggardliness or, or miserliness in Allah SWT is best. But there are certain ailments that are complex and therefore they have complex solutions for it. And we will look at that. But the point here would be this whole idea of recognizing the spiritual ailments, its causes and its solutions. What is the legal ruling thereof? So we've discussed a number of times, uh, for example, uh, if we look at, by the grace and mercy of Allah SWT, we fulfill the Isha prayer now. So the Isha prayer has a ruling. <coughs> and the rulings, the Islamic rulings, the Islamic <coughs> verdicts is one of five. It's quite easy also to memorize and we're quite familiar with it. So it's either wajib <coughs> on the one side and the polar opposite there would be haram. So something, any given thing, it's either compulsory to perform or it's either impermissible to perform. Alternatively, it may be recommended or it may be reprehensible for you to do that. And lastly, in the middle, you find something which is what they refer to in Arabic as mubah, religiously neutral. Allah is really indifferent in terms of you know, what you do in that particular set of circumstances. So Aisha would be an example of something which is compulsory. The witter prayer thereafter, in terms of our school of thought, it is considered to be recommended. Recommended. If you do it, you will be rewarded. If you omit it, you won't be punished. So the question now would be that the acquisition of this knowledge, what is the legal ruling thereof? So the author will mention two views. He's going to start off by mentioning the view of Imam Ghazali. So I can explain it very briefly. And then we can read through the text uh, as opposed to me just bl blabbering on. Imam Ghazali rahimahullah says, it is an individual responsibility. What we, what we refer to in Arabic as fard ayn, an individual responsibility. In other words, each and every one is duty bound. Each and every one is morally responsible to do what? To learn about the elements of the heart, the causes and the remedies thereof. It, like your other uh, acts of worship are uh, obligatory in the same way according to Imam Ghazali Rahimallah, it is considered to be obligatory. This is premised on a certain understanding of the human condition. So if Imam Ghazali Rahimallah say it is necessary for you to familiarize yourself with the human condition, in other words ailments, the causes thereof and the remedies there, it's supposing that these ailments are intrinsic to you as a human being. Imam Ghazali says you must acquire that knowledge by means of which you can rid yourself of the ailments, which is premised on what? That you actually possess the ailments in the first place. Because if you didn't possess the, ail uh, the, 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 the ailments, for example, if you look at another creation of Allah SWT, we read about it in the Isha prayer, and that is the angels. So the angels, by definition, would be, in terms of Quranic definition, يَفْعَلُونَ مَا يُؤْمَرُونَ They do what they are commanded to do. Uh, uh, by definition, an angel cannot commit an act of disobedience. Why? Because he's an angel. So in relation to an angel, would it be uh, uh, conceivable that we say to an angel, look, amongst what you need to do is learn about the ailments, learn about the causes of the ailments, and also the solutions to that. No, because it doesn't apply to him. So if we understand Imam Ghazali to say that it is an individual obligation and each and every person to learn about the ailments, the causes and the remedies, it is based on a view that these ailments are inherent. It's part of the human condition as if you are born with it and the test is for you to refine yourself and to learn about it, rid yourself of the ailments, its causes, and embellish yourself with the, with the solution. Is, is everybody okay with that? Right. Because there's an opposing view. There's an opposing view which says, look, it's, it's, it's not 
at individual obligation means that if you were born and you ما هذا بشرا إن هذا إلا ملك كريم this is not a human being this is an angel so your condition is like that of an angel uh, can we then say it's into it's, 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 the ruling doesn't apply because you don't have ailments in the first place uh, to to rid yourself of and in preparation for the for the lesson, I was thinking to myself that uh, the, this, this discussion is very much theoretical, because you need to ask yourself the question, in terms of your own human condition, do I have good qualities? Do I have bad qualities? If it is that you recognize that you have bad qualities, then it becomes an individual obligation for you to learn about what they are, to look at the causes thereof, and look for solutions. And that's basically إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهِ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ Success is reserved for that person who comes to Allah with a pure heart. What does a pure heart mean? A heart that is free of ailments. A sound, let's rather say sound heart. In other words, a healthy heart. A healthy heart is a heart free of all ailments. So those are the two views and that would basically be the, you know, the synopsis in terms of what is being mentioned. But I feel it's important that we, that we read uh, what certain have, of the scholars have to say in this particular, in this particular regard. Now. <coughs> I think it's very much like um, a person doesn't want to uh, uh, acquire education. Are we going to imp impose the acquisition of education upon him? Yes, we are going to. If a person is sick <coughs> uh, and he refuses to avail himself to medical care, we're going to coerce him uh, to subject himself to the medical care. Likewise, it's an individual obligation. You must, we don't have an option. As a Muslim, if you are beset with a certain uh, spiritual malady. Then according to Imam Ghazali, it is an individual obligation for you to treat, to treat that ailment. Like you treat um, uh, sugar, diabetes, cancer, and everything else. Likewise, uh, this is something that necessarily needs to be, needs to be treated. So he quotes a number of scholars in this particular regard, and we'll read through some of them, and it will give us some perspective inshallah and also some credence because there's a claim being made let's look at that man lam yatagallal fi ilmina hadha mata musirran ala al-kaba'ir so abu al-hasan al-shadhili uh, who is considered to be the head of what we have come to know as the shadhili way um, he has the following to say man lam yatagallal fi ilmina hadha whoever doesn't familiarize himself with this knowledge what knowledge are we talking about knowledge of the ailments of the heart Mata Musiran al Kabair, he may pass away whilst performing um, a major sin. Whilst he's completely oblivious of it. You know? Um, and if you just think of the, the analogy between the spiritual and the physiological physiological, you find a person, he's uh, he's completely unaware that he has cancer. And the cancer is actually in its advanced stages. By the time he gets to the hospital, there's nothing they do about it and he passes away. <coughs> so similarly, in a spiritual way, a person may be beset with a spiritual malady, but he doesn't even realize it because he hasn't actually asked himself the right questions. So this is an important, this is an important uh, phenomenon. And there's many ways to, 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 one of the ways, of the unique ways, and we mentioned it before in our class, is that when you have a good companion, who's a true mirror for you and actually tells you, that uh, you know you have this particular character trait. Let's say you're vain, but you do not see your vanity. Uh, or you're uh, a narcissist, but you don't realize it. Somebody needs to say it to you in order for you to actually realize it and then to work on it. So um, in our times, you, you, because a spiritual mentor is the ideal person to actually point it out to you. But in the absence of a spiritual mentor, a good friend can serve exactly that purpose. And we need to look for those good friends that will support us when we are right, 
but will also rectify us when we are wrong. And, and nowadays we have an aversion to such friends. Such a friend quickly becomes our, our enemy. But that's actually your true friend. Uh, that's actually your, uh, a true friend. Uh, no. يعني أمراض القلوب. What he means basically is the sicknesses of the of the heart. Imam Malik has the following to say: "من تفقه ولم يتصوف فقد تفسق." A person who is versant with the laws relating to um, uh, the apparent acts of worship, but he hasn't spiritually purified himself, فقد تفسق. Then um, he is guilty of sin. It's a sinful act. So um, not worrying about spiritual matters and spiritual reform in terms of Imam Malik is considered to be a, an, act of, an act of sin. It's considered to be sinful. May Allah SWT protect us. Now, قال في الخاطمة another one I'm selecting a few passages to to translate بإذن الله سبحانه وتعالى قال في الخاطمة وما سوى هذا العنق لا يحتاج إليه um, we need to prioritize in terms of knowledge so when it comes to the acquisition of knowledge are we going to prioritize the knowledge of the apparent or are we going to uh, prioritize the knowledge of the non-apparent so in the خاطمة it is said that Sometimes you don't need the apparent knowledge that you're acquiring. Whilst you, you, you always need the knowledge of the baltin, the knowledge of the, of the internal. No. So he says, وَرُبَّمَا أَضَرَّ بِصَاحِبِي مُدَاوَمَتُهُ عَلَيْهِ It could very well be that acquisition of apparent rulings actually causes you more harm than what causes you good. For example, you're sitting in an advanced class and you're learning all about the technicalities. And you mentioned before, you know, you get technical, um, uh, the scholars get electrical, and then you get shocked. You know, so uh, there's, 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 there's not a lot of benefit sometimes in mental gymnastics. It doesn't have any benefit. Uh, we discuss an issue about, um, that has very l little relevance really. And it's a type of difference of opinion that we came to hear about but as opposed to drawing us together, it actually just moves us apart. So sometimes a preoccupation with nitty gritty and hair splitting, it actually creates more problems than what it creates solutions. We're just doing a sort of like a, you know, juxtaposing the one knowledge to the other knowledge. And obviously in this um, context, the author is championing the knowledge of the internal and the importance of that particular knowledge. So he says, لَبُدَّ لِلْمَرْءِ مِنْ مُطَالَعَتِهِ كُلَّ حِينٍ You always have to be busying yourself with that knowledge that will facilitate for your spiritual refinement and development. In other words, what is it that I need to do in order to rid me of lesser qualities and embellish myself with the higher qualities? قَالَ إِبْنُ عَبَّادِ وَلْيَجَعَلِ الْمَرْءُ هَجِيرَاهُ مُطَالَعَةَ كُتُبِ التَّصَوُّفِ uh, what a person should do is that he should always have a book on spirituality as his companion that he references and he reads and he studies. You know, like we would say, you know, like a coffee table book or, you know, on, the, on, 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 on a bedside lamp, you have a book that you always, you know, before you sleep, you page through it and you're always uh, reading through it. Uh, so on your coffee table, there should be a book on spirituality. Uh, next to your bedside lamp, there should be perhaps the same book or another book in terms of Islamic spirituality. You should be reading about it all, 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 of, the, all of the time. Now, And also to um, befriend uh, the people of, you know, so the people who recognize Allah SWT, the people of Allah SWT. Because you are the company that you keep. And if you're going to keep the company of spiritually refined people, then inshallah you're also going to become spiritually refined. Mm -hmm. Now, imani wa yaqini, and in this way the light of his belief and the light of his conviction is strengthened. Watantafi anul ghirra, and he will not be he will not be duped by by this world. In the Isha prayer, we also read, "Inna uh, wa'ad Allahi haq, falatahurrannakum al-hayatu dunya." Do not be deceived by this worldly life. 
So how do we prevent ourselves from becoming deceived? By developing our belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by our conviction in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is done through the company of, of pious people. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the, the company. So inshallah, I think we can, we can conclude on, 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 on this, uh, this amount. And the synopsis is basically the importance Holding on to Imam Ghazali's view that it is an, uh, an individual obligation for us to learn about the spiritual ailments, the causes thereof, and also the remedies therefore. And in our reading through the book, inshallah, we're going to come across a number of that. Bismillah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We'll read a little bit about um, the liberalism, Bismillah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We started at Koto Pass, so we'll try to keep the lesson for about 45 um, Half an hour, bi'idhni Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we'll try to finish by 45 or 50, uh, bi'idhni Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ali sahab, you look very concerned there, man. <laughs> uh, no, I, did, I, I, I consciously intended not to ask you anything this evening, but you're looking so worried, subhanAllah. You know, looking this way, looking that way. I thought, subhanAllah. I don't know. Allah make it easy for you, man. So I'm going to backtrack, backtrack just a little bit uh, to look at this whole concept of um, uh, materialism <coughs> and always having a material analysis of things. And the, the background here, I think it's a very important background for, for us. Um, because it talks to very important uh, concepts. Uh, for example, uh, the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you want to do a material analysis, you only believe in something that you can see, feel and touch, then with that particular approach, you will not be able to establish the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be seen uh, in a material sense and felt in a material sense and touched in a material sense because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is... Uh, the creator of the material world and therefore not subject to the rules of the material world. Allah SWT is beyond that. Inna Allah ghaniyun anil alameen. Allah is free and beyond that. So the way we perceive Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not through um, our material senses, but we experience Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a different way. So when we talk about the material analysis, it's important for us to uh, be conscious of this, uh, be conscious of this. I read a book which is it's quite challenging to read. I read one, two, and I had to read it a few times by Shah Waliullah Dahlawi. He talks about certain wisdoms that he talks about. And he addresses how do human beings come to know? So how do we come to know things? We come to know things through our sensory perception. We come to know things, things through our intellect, which is located within our hearts. But beyond that, there's other ways that we come to know. There's other ways that we come to know. And that's how we come to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because you can reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through your intellect as a means. You can do that by deduction. Here's a created entity. Who created it? Allah created it. They must be in Allah. You come to the conclusion. So you can use it. But there are other ways through other people that are born with the recognition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do they come to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? They know Allah intrinsically. So there are different modes of getting to know. That's why the human being is quite unique in that particular regard. But for now, we want to look at tahleel al-madi, this material breakdown, and it's problematic. So he's going to give you a few examples. So I want to work through it slowly, and maybe perhaps just take a little bit, but we get the concept. What concept are they trying to explain? Uh, and I think that's important, and Allah knows best. So he, he, he's going to very quickly give us an example, which we did in, not last, perhaps the week before or the week before that. But we're going to read through it again, inshallah, and take our time just to grasp the, the concept of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he says, هذا أصل أقلي صحيح. It's a valid to do a, a material analysis of something. It's a, it's, 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 it's a valid um, intellectual approach, a logical approach. Yeah. As long as it's applied in context. But if it's taken out of context, and then it becomes a a problem. In other words, our intellect has a certain limit. Like our sensory perception has a certain limit. 
and the moment you maintain it to that particular limit, then it's going to work. But if you extend it beyond that, it's going to be a problem. So he says, and he gives this example. He says, فَاللِّسَانُ مُضْغَةٌ وَاحِدَةٌ The tongue is an organ. So the tongue ser serves a certain purpose. You know? And the, the purpose of the tongue is to taste. Like uh, the purpose of the nose is to smell. Uh, within your nose you have what they refer to as olfactory glands. And they're responsible for smelling. And your eyes have a certain purpose, it's to see. No. So the, the, the tongue is a limb. ليس كل أجزاء متساوية في تحليل مواد المطعومة حلاوة وملوحة ومرارة. Now your tongue has taste buds. Uh, but not all of the taste buds are equal. Certain taste buds will uh, determine sweetness. Certain taste buds will determine bitterness. Um, other taste buds will determine saltiness, etc., etc., etc. ومنها and then there are also certain things that can be tasted but it's not determined by the tongue so the author says وَمِنَا مَا لَا يُحْسِنُ اللِّسَانْ مَعْرِفَةَ طَعْمِ أَصْلًا there are certain things that it is not the tongue that determines what it tastes like so do we acknowledge that the tongue has taste buds to determine taste yes we do but if the tongue can't taste it it doesn't mean it cannot be tasted now you simply have to employ another one of your sensory perceptions in order to understand the taste. You can't, the fact that this, the tongue can't taste it, you're not going to say it cannot be tasted. It can still be tasted. Mm. What the tongue must do is, the tongue must now say, this thing is not within my domain. I can't taste it. But the nose will be able to determine what this thing tastes like. كَذَلِكَ الْأَقَلْ مَعَ الْغَيْبِ So when you have the intellect, you can say, yes, the intellect, you can do a material analysis of something to uh, do a breakdown of there and ascertain whether this thing is real or whether it's not real. But like the tongue has a limit to tasting certain things and discovering certain things, likewise, the intellect has a limit. And the intellect cannot determine uh, matters of the unseen. That must be left for the another faculty which Allah SWT has endowed you with. And it's almost intrinsic. What I find very unique in terms of the human, um, human beings gravitate towards the unseen whether they like it or not. Muslim, uh, human beings who negate the unseen, why are they attracted to um, uh, science fiction movies? It's, it's, it's very unique. By the very nature, human beings are attracted to the unseen. فهذا الأصل المادي ذا أطلق فهو أصل تمرد الأقل الضعيف على الأمر الإله العظيم. So when you when you when you don't uh, limit the the intellect to its uh, sphere of operation, and you extend it beyond its sphere of operation. That is when uh, you develop obstinance. Why? Because you tell yourself that if my, if, I, if my intellect, in terms of a material breakdown of a given concept, if my intellect cannot grasp it, then it means it's non-existent. And that becomes problematic. It's an overextension. So there's no problem with your intellect. But the problem is when we overextend the sphere of the, the, sphere of the, of the intellect, and that is... Uh, uh, very important. So, um, the example we gave, and inshallah we can defer that to our next week's lesson, would be the very first, and we've never looked at it in this particular way, that the first disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the devil, who duped Adam into partaking of the forbidden tree, the argument really was here you have a divine instruction. And then here you have a material interest. Are you going to go with the material interest or are you going to listen to the divine instruction? 
So the devil duped Adam into looking at it very materially. وَأَصَى آدَمُ رَبَّهُ فَغَوَى And Adam, as uh, is befitting to a messenger, was duped and he'd erred in terms of following through on the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our intellects and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not make it as such that our intellect, which is a tool that <coughs> distinguishes us from other created entities, that it be that tool that leads to our misguidance as opposed to our enlightenment. بارك الله فيكم جميعا. مرحبا. If there are questions, we'll take uh, five, ten minutes, inshallah. And then. Sometimes the questions also don't necessarily need to relate to the class. Maybe something comes to your mind or you feel there's something important. Feel free to make it. Fadal. No, 100%, I think you're quite articulate and clear in terms of your question. Uh, the, the, the challenge would be how to go about answering your question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, um, I think uh, the, the, the principal point that you're talking to is that we are Muslims which means we adhere to a particular law. That law is a divine law. That law takes the form of the Quran as shown to us by our beloved Master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it's quite simple in terms of how do we determine whether something is permissible or impermissible. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a pronouncement that this is permissible and that is uh, uh, not permissible, impermissible. So the question would be, what is the pronouncement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in as far as insurance is concerned? Now I think it's a bit challenging because insurance has a particular connotation to it which you have highlighted. Um, you were saying growing up that we were taught that insurance is impermissible. That is correct because the insurance in vogue at the time was a commercial form of insurance. And commercial insurance is impermissible. I think that's the first point. So two points. Talking to where we get our law from. And number two is talking to um, your reality in terms of how you grew up. Insurance, commercial insurance, impermissible. But if you look at insurance as a concept, insurance as a concept, so you mentioned two things. Life insurance, which is long-term insurance, and then you mentioned car insurance, which is an example of short-term insurance. What is insurance? Insurance is safeguarding yourself against a future possible risk. If I define insurance as safeguarding yourself against a possible future risk. 
So in other words, taking a measure to safeguard yourself against a future risk, is that permissible or not? So risk, risk, is risk part of life or not? Risk is part of life. <coughs> so as natural or as inherent as risk is to life, the same applies to taking a measure to safeguard you against that risk. I'll give you an extraneous example. Uh, before you leave, you listen to the weather forecast. The weather forecast says there's a possibility of rain. What do you do? To safeguard yourself against that potential risk, you take an umbrella with you or you take a jacket with you and so on. In light of that definition, if you look at the dream of Yusuf alayhi salam, so he dreamed that there's going to be seven good years followed by seven lean years. So what did he do in the seven good years? He made provision for the seven lean years. There's a risk of drought. So he put measures into place that's going to safeguard him uh, in, 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 times of, in, times of, in times of drought. So the, the important part is to understand what insurance means. Insurance is simply safeguarding against a future risk. And is it valid, permissible to take measures to safeguard against a future risk? Yes. The challenge would be what vehicle do you employ in order to uh, safeguard yourself against that future risk? So that brings us to this discussion of currently you have two types of insurances. The one is a commercial insurance, which generally our scholars consider to be impermissible. And the first scholar to make a pronouncement on that would be Shaykh Muhammad Amin ibn Abidin in his Hashia. He considered uh, commercial insurance to be impermissible. However, on the other hand, you have what we refer to as a cooperative mutual insurance. In Arabic, it is referred to as a ta'min at ta'awuni. It's a cooperative insurance. There's like a pseudo consensus amongst contemporary scholars that this type of insurance, in South Africa we know it as takafu, that this type of insurance is permissible. So what, the, what, what are the features of this type of insurance? It's basically a group of people that face a similar risk. So let's say for example all of us are drivers. So as drivers we face the risk of an accident. To safeguard ourselves against this risk, what do we do? We pool our monies together. So we have a fund. We all contribute towards that particular fund. That fund is governed by certain rules. The basic rule is that in, an, in the advent of an accident, okay, then, and you're a contributor, then you're entitled to a payout. So that is basically in broad terms, the cooperative model of insurance. As opposed to commercial insurance. So you would have noticed that in the cooperative model, there's a sharing of risk. All of us as drivers are subject to a risk. And it's a risk of an accident. When we contribute to the fund, what are we doing? We're sharing the risk. Whereas in a commercial insurance, what happens is you approach a commercial company. What do you do? You transfer the risk. You pay a premium, and in lieu of the premium that you pay, should you meet up in an accident, they're going to pay you out. It's a commutative transaction, which is very much different from a cooperative transaction. That, in a nutshell, is, is the ruling of insurance. So insurance of two types, commercial, impermissible, cooperative, permissible. If you have like a specific uh, insurance contract that you want me to look at, we can look at it and I can tell you whether it's permissible or not. In South Africa, generally, the medical aids are based on a mutuality model. So mutuality model. If you want to get a good appreciation of a mutuality model and how it differs from your conventional insurance model, you can also go to the PPS website. 
and they will they have a few videos there that explains to you how a mutuality works. Say help my car. How does a key fight clubs work, Anis? Are you part of a key fight clubs? And if you my ningle tomorrow, then what are we going to do? <laughs> It's dying, but a key fight clubs is based on what? If I join the key fight clubs today, and for two months I pay 25 rand, and I'm a ningal, then they're going to cover the cost of 8,500 rand for all the uh, expenses. So if you look at it from a commercial point of view, what did I do? I gave 50 rands, and then what? Did, how much did I get? 8,500 rand. I need don't my ningal know it's expensive affair. <laughs> You know, give us a chance, man, you know, <laughs> it's an expensive The holes nowadays, 1,000, 2,000 rands. Right. But, but you, un you understand the, co the concept, said. So, at the time, when our scholars of old, when they said insurance is impermissible, they didn't put the same label on the Kifite clubs. But if you look at it in terms of function, the Kifite clubs is the same. But the model is different. This is a mutuality model. It's a help my car. Whereas the other one is a commutative. So it's important to answer. Okay, so is there not something to be by that's so attached to commercial insurance? It can it be attached to a mutuality as well. There's two concepts. The one concept is that the 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 the, the, the one concept is the vehicle, the structure. And this is maybe not the best example, man. Right? But if you think of structure, how one structure makes something permissible, another structure makes impermissible. Girlfriend and boyfriend, we call that fornication. But the moment they exchange marriage vows, they do the same thing. And we consider it to be a charity. What has changed? Only the structure. I'm just thinking of extraneous examples uh, along which your mind must start thinking when you think of these contracts, man. Are you, you with me? I'll give you an example. Another, one, of the mo one of the most salient examples in this thing would be uh, the, 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 the Prophet Sallallahu does he consume zakah? No, it's prohibited. So one day he comes home and he partakes of some food stuff. And then it is said to him that this is zakah. It was given to Barira. The Prophet Sallallahu <coughs> says, لَهَا زَكَاتٌ وَلَنَا صَدَقَةٌ For her, it came to her as zakah. But when she gives it to me, in turn, that money has been reconstructed. It's no longer zakah. It's a charity for me now. So the importance of construction. Not to defeat the law, but that's just the nature of things. If you construct the same thing in a particular way, then it's permissible. But if you construct it in a different way, then it's impermissible. It's, I think marriage is probably one of the most salient examples that you can use. Boy, girl, fornication. We frown upon it. But boy, girl, they exchange marriage vows. It's like <laughs> the best thing. Uh, so, uh, if you just you know think about it. So somebody else had a question on that. Ali Sir. It's a contract that's different, yes. Because I'm paying the same amount every month, and then my, in an accident, they fix my car, or is there a limit to what they will fix my car to with it? I get the same benefit. The, 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 the outcome is exactly the same. Okay. Look, if, if boy and girl gets, to me the, gets together, the outcome of them getting together, the experience, the, the sensual experience, it's the same. But in one case it's fornication, in another case it's it's a charity. It's a good deed. In one other case it's a bad deed. Why? Because of contract. Uh, but it's very important to understand that it's not uh, the, 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 uh, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, changing of terms and terminology. It is a fundamental underlying change. Look, this idea this idea, or rather this, um, this, um, the, 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 
Alisa, you used the word in conversation that we had the other day, obfuscation. You know this, uh, what's another word? Ambiguity. Ambiguity. It's not something of today. It's something recorded in Quran. Because the pagan Arabs, when Allah outlawed riba, so what is riba? Riba is, I lend you a thousand rand, and then when you repay me, you must pay me, repay me a thousand, the principal amount, plus interest. So you repay me a thousand and fifty rands. When Allah outlawed that, then the pagan Arabs retorted by saying, what's the difference between the 50 rand that I earn as interest and the 50 rand I earn as profit? And it's, 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 a, it's a very, it's a very, uh, it's a very uh, important thing. Halal uh, al wa haram al riba. Innam al bay'u mithlu al riba. They're saying that this riba, which is proscribed, is exactly the same like a sale. How can Allah allow the sale and proscribe the riba? And what are they looking at? They're looking at the outcome. That in, in when I lend you, then I get 50 rand in terms of interest. When I sell it to you at a profit, then I make 15 in profit. I bought it at a thousand rands, I sell it to you. But we know the difference. There's a number of... Um, uh, 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 subtle yet salient profound differences difference when I lend you a thousand rands my capital is guaranteed number one then the return is also guaranteed because it's stipulated positive return and there's no risk to it that's why in today's time it's not a joke that banks never lose it's a matter of fact because of the contract it's a loan contract no matter what Happens to your business, you have to repay the loan. You're contractually obligated to repay the loan. That's why the bank never loses. So that's in a, that's in a, then when I, in, in a sale there's a risk. I buy something, I might not find the market to sell it. And the, so there's a, there, there's a risk related to it. And the return is, the return could very well be negative because I sell it at a loss. So what's the interesting thing, Abdullah ibn Mani, and I wouldn't have said this if he didn't say it. So understanding the salient differences between the underlying contracts is the key to give us an appreciation of Islamic contract law and by extension Islamic finance. It's fundamental. Abdullah ibn Mani he came actually to, to the MJC many moons ago and he said that the person who says that Islamic finance, the proper now Islamic finance and uh, conventional finance is the same he fits into one of two categories. And the one is more severe than the other one. The first one is as, he's an ignoramus. He's, he doesn't know what he's talking about, number one. Or number two, which is worse. You can take him out of the fold of Islam. Because he's now equating what Allah made a difference to. Remember in terms of Allah al wa haram al riba And therefore I think it's, uh, you know, you, some of the brothers I go to them and then they tell me that uh, um, they tell me uh, we have two types of finance you know we have the conventional finance and the Islamic finance if you want it but you know Muslim it's all the same <laughs> uh, so you know <laughs> it gets me quite worried because it's a it's a it's a weighty statement to make man because it's not the same I, th I think could it be that, that, that what is forgotten is, is the tawakkul the one that was one supposed to have so the example one of them is saying on the one side, when I get involved, uh, the interest will be paid back to me, and I'm quite uh, secured. I won't lose anything. And the other side, I buy something to sell. So uh, the system that Allah created is for you to have the that includes the tawakko. 100%. So that's a very important uh, point, uh, because irrespective of whether you go with a, you know, like a, a Sharia compliant, uh, product or you go with non sharia compliant product ultimately at the end of the day we believe that our sustenance comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you know what is meant for us will accrue to us what's, ne what, what, what's not meant for us will not accrue to us what was going to hit you will hit you and what's going to miss you is never going to hit you so uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows, knows best Haji are you, are you okay there at the back? <laughs> I wouldn't want you to look more worried than <laughs> when you answer the, ask the question
Allah bilesin. Bismillah. From where, from where I'm standing, from where I'm standing, uh, you you can be at complete ease that the, the, the products that are offered, particularly in South Africa, that say that they are Sharia compliant, they are Sharia compliant, hundred uh, percent. Ali Sab told me in the week that uh, for me to say it's like a conflict of interest because I'm a practitioner. You're, you're with me. But that's what Ali Sabi said, I'm not saying it. I'm just saying what he said. <laughs> I'm not saying it. I'm not... Uh, he, that's what... <laughs> <laughs> Depends on the commission. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm uh, just having some light-hearted banter. But I can, I, uh, you know, uh, Subhanallah, uh, we're very fortunate in South Africa. Um, uh, the, the, the expertise. I'm, 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 I'm fortunate that I am, uh, am, am exposed to the expertise that exists on these boards. Uh, specialist expertise. And uh, you know, one of the most important uh, concerns of a believer is to ensure that his sustenance is permissible. So that's like one level. But what about those persons that concern themselves that other people's earnings are permissible? And that's basically what Sharia practitioners do. It's almost as if, look, Muslims were going to invest anyway. But what they do is they create a niche whereby Muslims can still invest with the, with the, with the, with the comfort that the investments are Sharia compliant. So, you know, it's like, it's, it's a really uh, a unique, a unique service. And I can tell you, it's a lot of work. May Allah reward them. I come in at the tail end, so I can speak about them like they're the other. And I've seen, uh, you know, the, the, the amount of work that, that, that goes into uh, uh, really developing these products and ensuring that the products are, in real terms, Sharia compliant. And they are fundamentally different. Uh, <coughs> at the end of the day, for your own comfort, what you need to do is like every bank has a Sharia board, man. like Al Baraka Bank has a Sharia board. Um, your confidence in the product is an extension of your confidence in those scholars that sit on the Sharia board. And every Sharia board has different scholars. So FNB will have their own Sharia board, uh, Al Baraka will have their own Sharia board, Standard Bank will have their own Sharia board, and, and so forth. And Subhanallah, um, the, the expertise they are. Rock solid expertise. I've seen in the Sharia board meetings where the Sharia scholars offer business advice, not Sharia compliant advice. CEOs, you know, thanking the Sharia board for business advice. <laughs> Cash flow issues and all of that. Yeah, Sharia board guys, they, <laughs> they sort you out. Alhamdulillah. No, really, it's uh, Subhanallah. It's 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 it's, uh, it's it's amazing. Barakallah fikum is. So, inshallah, we end up on that point. Jazakum Allah khairan. Barakallah fikum. Wa jazakum Allah khairan. Jaza Subhanallah. Bihamdi Subhanakallah. Bihamdi kanshiru Allah. Nastaghfiruka. 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 Nastaghfiruka.